So hi everyone, this is the uh, mini course on computation and today we are going to have uh, Angel from Cornell to talk about uh, something about creativity. And Angel is a PhD student at uh, Cornell and studying like a human computer interaction. Yeah, so I think it's a very, she's a very good right person to <laughs> talk about like the connection between like, computation and reality especially in this uh, interesting aspects of creativity, which is not really captured by like uh, the theory at this moment. So I'm very excited to like Angel's talk. And yeah, now it's your stage, Angel. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chining, for the very nice intro. And um, nice to see everyone here at the mini course. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and so as Chining has already introduced, uh, I am a HCI researcher uh, and also a grad student at Cornell University. Um, so I do want to kind of like give a disclaimer. A lot of things that we'll be discussing today is first of all, more philosophical. It's more high level. It may be a little bit different from some of those former lectures and guest talks that have been introduced in the class so far. Um, and also um, a lot of things that we discussed today um, still do not have a solid answer um, to them. So, um, jump in anytime if you have any thoughts, any ideas, or like, as I mentioned earlier, feel free to just interrupt me at any point. Um, this should be more of a discussion rather than a lecture. And so, yeah, so off we go. Um, let's see. So I want to start the lecture by asking everyone, what's your opinion on what do you think creativity is? So now I will... Um, I'll share a link in the, let me share a link in the chat. And so everyone can click on the link. It should takes you to like, um, like a, like a polling kind of things. And then, um, I'll ask you to insert some of the words and phrases that comes to you um, when you think about creativity. Uh, no pressure for filling out all the blanks. Um, you can, if you only, if you can only think about one word or two words, um, just submit them. If something later on comes up to you, you can also um, submit more words. Um, I mean, you can resubmit things to to this online poll. Um, okay, um, so yeah, my, my apologies, but the link doesn't work. Um, oh really? Yes, it, 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 uh, the, the link opens, but it says, sorry, but this presentation is no longer active. Oh, that's interesting. I think the QR code work. Yeah, so. Oh, really? Or do, or yes, do people I, I want I use to... the QR code and it works. Oh, I'm so sorry about the link not working. Okay, so do people want to scan the QR code instead? Um. Yeah, apologize about that. Sorry, I actually did test the link before the class, but I'm really not sure why it is not working at this point. Um, but yeah, feel free to use your phone to scan the QR code and then um, and, and then you can also fill that out with your with your phone. Yes, I, I think the problem was in, in letters being capital. Somehow it wasn't. Oh, okay, yes. interesting. Okay, that's something that I didn't know about the site before today, but that's good to know. Okay. So we'll maybe give people like one, two more minutes to write off stuffs. Um, and let me actually share another screen on my site. Okay, so this is kind of like a mini word cloud that people um, that comes from responses from our class, as you can see, it will keep like changing along the way when people are um, submitting more and more responses to the poll. Um, but these are some of like the top of mind things that people think about um, that people associate with creativity actually. So for example, there are art, people think about ideas, People think about creativity as something novel, something innovative, something that can bring you surprises, um, being out of the box, 
Um, I also see music come up a lot. People think about creativity as um, associated with different types of like musical composition or musical styles and forms. So yeah, so as you can see, everyone's view to creativity is, is very different, right? Um, just within our class, we have so many different responses and different concepts that is um, that people think about um, or people associate with when they relate to creativity. So this, I hope this kind of like give you a sense of like how chaotic this space of creativity research is. Um, and indeed, scholars and practitioners in this field don't really have a very solid, um, don't really have like a common agreement on what creativity should be yet. And so um, going back to our slides, so today in our discussion, oh, actually, I've already introduced myself, so I'll kind of just skip this slide. And so in today's um, discussion, I would like to start off by talking about why we care about creativity um, in the age of human machine partnership. And this is also kind of like the why, why the topic today is kind of related to um, Chining's um, mini course topic on computation, um, because if we are not interested in um, teaching or allowing machines um, to be capable of performing creative stuff, why do we at all care about um, how we'll be able to computate creativity? Um, but on the other hand, when it becomes more and more clear that um, machines, computers, artificial intelligence will play a critical role in our future, uh, in the future of work. Um, it is important for us to know how can we break down creativity step by step? How can we um, compute and even quantify creativity so that we can transform it to something that is teachable um, to a computer to um, a robot or to other forms of artificial intelligence. And so think about all these different forms of robots or AIs or uh, machines. Um, there can be the cases when this is like how we typically interact with them. Like we are like the person who sent out the, uh, who sent out the commands, we tell computers what to do and they do exactly um, what we ask for. And there are also the case when robots and computers can be more independent, like those robots in um, the factories, they're kind of just doing their own jobs. Um, and moreover, in, in some cases, for example, somewhere in the outer space, a lot of time we actually have to rely on um, machines to, for human beings to be able to see what's, uh, what's going on in the outer space. And in today, we will focus our lens on thinking about creativity under the scope of human collaborating with computers and computers collaborating with humans. And in these cases, um, how do, do we want um, our, our bot, our um, computer partners um, to be involved in our creative thinkings, to be a part of us coming up with more creative stuff, um, or should, should this be a topic that uh, machines and AI should just give their hands off? Um, so this is kind of the setup for today's, uh, for today's talk. And before going into um, the key components on today's, uh, on today's lecture, I, I thought it would be interesting to kind of like give people a sense of what the creative mind um, it, it looks like and what people have done related to, for example, in the field of neuroscience, in the field of um, looking at the creative mind from a more biological sense. So there are a few um, kind of like popular thoughts, trend of thoughts or theories that associate with how people think about the creative mind in a more biological sense. Um, a group of, um, um, so there are a group of um, schoolers and a, a group of people who support the theories that actually when our mind are coming up with creative stuff, um, there's nothing more than our ordinary mind. There's nothing special about our mind or our brain when um, it is coming up with something creative, just like how it is working on ordinary day-to-day -day, um, errands and, and stuff. 
Um, and on the other, kind of like extending from this point of view, um, some scholars believe that, well, it actually depends on how much training you have related to creative thinking. If you are kind of a creative expert, which deal with creative thinking from um, day in, day out, when you are working on creative tasks, you kind of also go into this autopilot mode. You kind of, uh, your brain is kind of more laid back and more relaxing, similar to the resting state of your brain um, when it is working on creative thinking. Um, conversely, if you are kind of a novice, um, you're kind of someone who is not very, um, who, who does not deal with creative thinking on a regular basis, when you have to really come up with something novel and creative um, on your end, your brain go into, um, relies very heavily on say, like the prefrontal areas of your brain um, involving in a lot of execution thinking, involving in a lot of planning and also other more high level states of, um, of thinking in, in your mind. And finally, um, and there's another group of scholars proposing this idea that, well, creativity think, uh, and thinking creatively is actually just a very advanced, uh, just, a very, um, just a very high level, uh, high level way of how we associate with different types of things. And in fact, through neuroimaging studies, people have found that um, creative experts, when they are working on creative tasks, their brain um, associate with more stuff, their brain kind of like relate um, and activate more different parts of, of your brain regions to, oh, um, to perform more um, sophisticated associative learning when you are working on something creative. So in short, that just means for people who are really creative, they're just better, uh, better at connecting the dots, connecting things that may seem very remote um, to other people. So these are some of like um, how people have viewed creativity from, a sen uh, from um, the sense of uh, a more biological um, or more of uh, neuroscience-y kind of perspectives. And um, keep these in, in mind, keep this like in, in the back of your head while we proceed with today's discussion. So going um, moving forward to today's key components, there are four things that I hope to cover in today's lectures. Um, first of all, we want to at least take some attempts to try to define what creativity is. Um, I'll introduce some of like the popular um, proposals from former schoolers. And then we want to think about what is the process and if there is actually a process of creative thinking. And then we will talk about how do we measure and evaluate creativity? And finally, what is creativity for us as human beings as a type of experience? What do you go through? What do you experience when you are working on creative stuff? And what is that very exciting feelings um, of the Eureka moment? And, um, as we go along the line, um, I encourage you to think about how do you quantify to uh, your answers to some of these questions that we um, that we talk about today. Um, and yeah, so so that's just like a, a, a reminder for for you to keep in the back of your head. All right. Oh, so sorry, sorry to interrupt, Angel, but there's yeah. a question uh, in the chat. Okay. The clarification question. Do you want me to read it out or? Yeah, I'm looking at um, the question right now. So the question asked uh, by a creative expert, do you mean someone who is trained in creativity? Is it re really creativity if you can trend in it? So very awesome question over here. We will actually talk about um, a couple of studies later on um, to compare, um, uh, which looks into uh, comparing creative experts versus like ordinary people. So uh, here by creative experts, um, we I do mean these, um, prof uh, these are professionals who deal with um, creative topics on day-to-day -day, um, basis. So from, those more obvious cases, you can think about um, creative experts such as uh, say designers or people in general work in the creativity industry. 
their um, day-to-day -day work involve, their day-to-day -day jobs involve like uh, creative thinkings, coming up with more ideas. Um, so if you think about the case of like different roles of people who work, say in working in like a consulting firm, um, people who are more heavily involved on coming up with new strategies, coming up with new product designs, these are uh, professionals who are considered as creative experts in previous research um, versus, for example, if your job is more of like just keeping things, uh, getting things done, um, getting things, uh, moving things forward in, in a more logistical sense, then um, these are not the type of people that are considered as creative experts, at least in former research. Um, and also another comment related uh, mentions that intelligence is often related to creativity. Um, so it has been treated as a special feature of your brand, not as something natural. Um, so again, thank you for this very awesome comments. Um, we'll also talk about, briefly mention about um, the relationship of intelligence and creativity when we talk about the definition of it. Okay, so thank you for the, for the comments and questions so far. Um, and let's move forward a little bit uh, and also maybe let me keep the chat window open so that I don't miss people's questions. Okay, so um, all right. So um, starting off with defining creativity, um, again here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there actually isn't like a agreement among all the creativity scholars thus far, um, even though you may thought that, oh, people want to study creativity, at least they need to know how to define it, right? Um, but that is actually not the case, at least up to now. Um, so um, researchers first started to study creativity in the psychology domain. Um, when they started off thinking about creativity, um, people, um, the common belief, um, at least at that time, um, the common beliefs is that, well, creativity at least have to be something novel, have to be something new. And it cannot just be something that is new, but kind of weird and useless. So it also has to be appropriate. It has to be functional to some extent. And also as one of our brilliant uh, comments also mentioned earlier, um, a lot of scholars, early, uh, earlier scholars believe that creativity should be treated as a type of intelligence. It should be similar to how we view your IQ. Um, it should be something that can be measured on the scales. Um, and also some people believe that creativity is a type of emotional experience. It is similar um, to how we experience happiness, sadness, and the moments of, of you coming up with something inspiring that is just a very exciting ex emotions. And that's what creativity is. Um, on the other hand, some scholars believe that creativity should be treated as a type of personality. Um, if you have certain unique personality traits, then you're more capable of coming up with things that are creative. And finally, um, in like a more cognitive science, point of view to creativity, some scholars also believe that creativity is just making a series of very, very good decisions. And then creativity is the outcomes of your decision making. So um, on top of that, later on, there are um, scholars kind of, kind of like coming out from like um, design schools, coming out from people who do former trainings in say visual arts, visual designs, industrial designs. Their point of view of divining creativity um, as in a, a couple more perspectives. So they believe that, well, first of all, if it is creative, it has to be able to express your thoughts. It has to be able to express you as a human being to some sense. And in order to execute creativity, in order to externalize your creative juice, you have to involve in certain degree of technical skills. If you just have a whole bunch of great ideas, but, but you're not able to take them into practices and put them into actual forms and shapes, then maybe you're creative, but not to the full extent of creativity. And then um, also for um, uh, another 
popular turn of thoughts in design schools. People believe that creativity is a kind of just combining new things together. So some scholars believe that there is actually no true creativity. No one really come up with things that is entirely new and novel. It's just that some people are very good at combining things that other people don't see the connections with. So this is kind of related to um, the associated thinking kind of um, kind of um, ideas when we talk about um, the neurological sense of um, creativity, and. Finally, in design schools, um, they actually teach students um, that creativity can be break or creative thinking can be broken down into step by step process. And we'll also talk about the process of creativity in, in just a few slides. And finally, um, in more of like the recent studies where people started to look at, well, then these ideas of creativity seems mostly coming out from um, from the standpoint of people working on creative content. But what about um, integrating the views from the audience of creativity? So in this sense, um, some of these more um, recent research, for example, people looking at social media, people looking at popular culture, um, they also associate creativity with the idea of like, well, how do you brand your product? When people see your work, do they see a certain type of unique branding here? Um, is it visible enough? Is it capable of um, being viral on, on social media or different types of platforms? And finally, does it tell a good stories? Uh, does it tell the compelling stories that your audience would really love to consume over and over again? So now taking a complete different route um, to think about creativity, let's think about how we can possibly kind of like quantify uh, some of these concepts. So, if we, so let's starting from like the very basic idea of like creativity being novel, if we, if that is our goal of what creativity should pursue after, then um, it is very much just pursuing things that as, uh, that is as rare as possible, right? But we also know that it has to be appropriate and functional. It has to be able to, um, to put in front of the audience at, um, and make possible to some extent. And if creativity is something that's just like drawing connections and drawing combinations um, from all um, interesting thoughts and thoughts, then um, I want to think about creativity as like something rare, but also um, conditioning on what? conditioning on what kind of scenarios that create this rare combination of creative stuff. And so if we adding up to the idea of like making a series of good choices, making a series of applying good styles, good techniques to create stuff, then essentially you want to it's kind of like the process of like selecting things from a whole series of possible combinations, right? And then um, if we just repeat this process over and over again and conditioning on all the great stuff, whether that means your popularity, uh, what's being favored by audience on social media, what's being favored as a brand. Um, and then you can, for example, inform your decision making by, oh, this is what's going to be viral. Oh, this is what's going to be attention grabbing um, and making a a whole long series of decisions and make all the best choice, all the optimal choice out of them. And is this creativity? Is there still something missing from, from the sense of what you believe creativity is? So um, think, take, maybe take a, take a minute to, to think about, um, to, to think about the, the, this questions. And um, while you're thinking, put that again, put that in the back of your head. Um, we will, um, I'll, I'll proceed a little bit to talk about what other people are, are thinking. So some, some scholars, after, after thinking about all these like definitions, whether in language or in computational sense, some scholars believe that, forget about this, we actually know what creativity is. 
while we probably can't define creativity in a very formal sense, but as human beings, when we see creative stuff, we just know it. Um, especially, uh, in, in fact, this is something that people in visual science have been doing a lot um, when they show different images, when they show different visuals to, um, to participants, to people that they bring into the lab. Indeed, some of those more creative piece um, actually sim uh, triggers larger neural responses in people's mind. And so um, in, in light of these type of findings, um, this type of research, some, some scholars believe that we, we just know it is creative when, when we see certain content. And on the other hand, some other more, um, I guess somewhat more pessimistic view of creativity is that, well, forget it. We, we don't know what creativity is. Let's not spend all our efforts and time on defining this in things that seems impossible to define. Um, but do we really not know what creativity is? So um, in, in, in light of this point of view, some scholars thought, well, we should maybe take a, a look at what the creative experts, um, those people who seems to know a lot about creativity, let's take a look at what these experts um, do creative stuff. And indeed, they found very different patterns um, comparing creative experts to people who do not have formal trainings of creativity or creative thinkings. So um, some, not, uh, some obvious um, distinction is that creative experts tend to pay a lot more attention on the process of creativity. They tend to think a lot more about creativity from like a more practical, from like the more execution level of creativity. Um, here, I will not go into like the nitty gritties of this huge charts. Um, if people are interested in discussing uh, more details about the distinctions between creative experts and novice, I'm happy to chat after class. Um, but here, I actually want to show you a study um, that can probably be a little bit more intuitive in terms of what creativity is. So um, previously um, in our lab, we did a longitudinal study um, recruiting people who are creative experts versus um, people who are just ordinary people um, who do not work on creative topic on, um, or uh, do not work in the creativity, uh, creative industry at least. And we showed them kind of this, um, this uh, we present them this like pseudo website that mirrors um, Behance. For some of you may know or some of you may not know, Behance is like a social media site that um, uh, select uh, creative contents and present them to, to the audience. And so we mirror those contents from the Behance site to create this um, pseudo website. And then we tracked um, what participants um, look at and what they select as creative contents on the site um, over the course of a month. And using like their web tracking data, um, we kind of, uh, we, we, we want to take a look at what people are actually looking at when, when they visit, uh, when, when there are a whole bunches of creative contents being presented to them. So what we found here is that for people who are not uh, creative experts, their viewing patterns is more random. They look at all type of stuff. They have their own personal tastes, own preferences. Um, they look at um, images that is really just what they like and everyone likes different things. So um, it, they end up looking at very different stuff. Um, but for creative professionals, what they click and look on and also what they select as creative pieces are more clustered compared to um, non-professionals. And another interesting point of view is that um, when we try to kind of like clusters or kind of like plots um, all the creative contents using um, a machine learning technique called Disney's um, style map, um, you can, uh, this is kind of just like visualizing and then mapping different images in space in terms of like how similar they are um, in, in terms of uh, how similar they are um, in, in different metrics space. And um, in fact, um, what 
the, the professionals, people, when they look at the contents, they have this like greater um, tendency to, to look at things that also uh, that kind of like cluster in a way um, of how machine would cluster things as well. And so- Sorry in, to interrupt and yeah. joke. There's a <laughs> question in the chat. I think okay. we'll uh, take a look. Okay. Sorry, uh, the last like one. Let's check out the, the question. Okay, does number of like affect their response? So that's a very good question. Um, we yeah, as you can saw, uh, as you can see in like the previous slides on like the pseudo website, we actually also presented the number of likes and views, kind of like the social metrics um, on our pseudo sites. And so what we found is. Um, non-professionals are more affected by those social metrics. They are more likely to click on things that are um, that has more likes and views um, showing to them. While the professional people are kind of just choosing um, their, uh, their choices of creative content that they would like to view is not related to those social metrics. But in fact, um, the non-professional people would also tell uh, also told us that their choices of creative contents have nothing to relate to the social metrics, even though they're actually being affected implicitly. So that's like an extra um, piece of info here. Yeah. And um, okay, so moving so um, it, in light of the findings over here, um, again, maybe think about what this what this teaches. Like, um, if after training, after a certain type of training, people tend to view creative content in a more um, specific or in a more similar way as what these creative experts do. Can we also teach machines um, to become better at recognizing creative stuff if there's actually a way of being better at recognizing creative stuff. Okay. And so. Oh, moving. sorry. There's oh. another, another question in the chat. Yes. Okay. Do professionals choose more diverse themes? Um, if you compare that to the non-professionals, then no, because as you can saw in the previous slides, um, the non-professionals just look at all different sorts of stuff. They consider all, all different sorts of stuff as creative versus professionals. Um, their choices of creative content tend to be more, um, more confined. They tend to be um, more similar with one another. And they do settle on certain themes um, that, um, compare, uh, that uh, compared to the non-professionals, they have more, uh, a more diverse range of choices of creative content. Great question, by the way. And so that's a wrap to the first topic of uh, that I would like to cover today. And then so moving on to the second question um, related to the process of creativity. So um, we kind of already opened up this conversation of like, then if we can train those creative experts, can we also train machines to become more creative? Um, and can creativity be learned? Um, in any sense. Okay, so in the past, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of scholars who study the process of creativity. Um, what they do is to recruit, again, recruit maybe creative experts, maybe just ordinary people um, into the lab. They give them certain types of creative tasks. We'll also talk about creative tasks um, in later slides. So they'll give them some creative tasks, ask them to work on these creative tasks, and then, or also to work on their own creative task. Um, and then um, these scholars observe their process and then record them and then break them down into step-by-step -step processes. As you can see, um, people have started to do this as early as in the 1920s, and they're still doing it in the, um, up, up to just uh, a few years ago. Um, and let me, uh, and, and one thing that people found very interestingly later on is um, across all these different schoolers, across all these different trends of thoughts, we can actually kind of like categorize these steps into four big components. So first of all, um, people start 
tend to start with, first of all, you have to define your creative question, where you are solving your question, in which space, in what type, what is the actual creativity um, questions they want to solve. And then you go out there to gather maybe some information, some data, or um, some knowledge that is essential to the questions and problems that you want to solve. And then um, typically what people do next is let your ideas sit a little bit, um, not think about this challenging creative question for a little bit, and then coming back to work and make it happen, make, uh, take it into practice. And finally, um, you want to evaluate whatever outcomes that you produce and then try to um, either, here I frame it as like how you sell your idea um, and think about how you present your ideas to other people is also um, one thing that previous scholars have found really critical in, the, in humans' creative processes is to think about, okay, now I have this idea in my head, how do I externalize it? How do I communicate it? so that other people can also understand my creative ideas. How do I make my ideas concrete? Um, and so this, these are um, the, the big uh, steps of what people think about um, when, when people think about creative process. So in this sense, if we can break creativity into step-by-step -step processes, um, does it mean if we follow all these steps, then we can come up with something creative. Is, is, does this feel right? Does this feel like how you would conceive creativity? Okay, so I also saw another question in the chat. Um, so <clears throat> the question asks, uh, do you mean an idea won't be creative unless it is communicated and others approve it? So this is actually something also very controversial in the creativity research domain. Um, some people believe that you can be wildly creative, um, but then no one else cares about your work versus like some people believe that, for example, as we saw in the previous comparison between novice and experts, if your idea is truly creative, then other people tend to agree it. Other people tend also to see your ideas as creative. So um, this is why previous research also considered the ability of communicating and especially concretizing your ideas into something that other people can understand is a critical step in the creativity process. I don't know if you have experienced this type of things, but that actually happened to me a lot. Sometimes when I think about ideas in my head, um, you have this idea of like, oh, um, I think I know how this works, um, but it is not until you have to explain it to some other people that actually requires you to kind of like refine your ideas and also make it more um, tangible, make it more solid. And through that process, it actually improves the quality of your ideas as well. So that is um, why people also consider that as a, a crucial step in creativity. Um, but again, that is something that is also still up to debate. And um, I saw another question about like any data related to creativity with age. Um, are young people more creative and um, than old people? So I don't have content related to this, unfortunately. And also, um, I don't think I have an answer to that. I do think people look into the relationship of, um, of like age and creativity, um, but maybe um, later on in one of my slides, I'll talk about the relationship of time and creativity. And maybe that's a, that's a place where you can think about um, the relationship between the two. So yeah. And I also realized I maybe need to move forward, uh, proceed a little bit more with, with the slides because they're kind of short uh, on time a little bit. Okay. So um, I'll maybe- Over the last three and a half million years. Okay, I'll maybe skip this video, um, but I'll just break down um, the essential things that is being covered in the video. 
So recently in a lot of tech company, they're proposing this idea of generative design or generative creativity. Essentially what uh, the idea of, um, of generative design is to, first of all, let users, um, being, being human beings, um, input their design goals and constraints to, um, to a system. And then the computer will run all the simulations of possible design solutions. And some of those programs are even capable of optimizing and finiting the set of possible design solutions. And finally, users would evaluate whether these possible outcomes are good or bad, and then, um, and then pick a final choice. And um, if they're not happy with whatever um, the program produced, then it can, um, users can go back, refine their design goals and constraints, and then do it all over again. So if this is some, uh, a sort of like a new form of creative process, then um, what exactly is the role of human beings in such a process? Um, so for example, um, this is an output of Autodesk um, generative design programs when they use the programs to do like product design for a car. Um, does this look at any, like anything that people like human beings have come up with in the past? Probably not, right? And so in this sense, what do we need human in the creative process? What can human offer in the creative process? Um, is it like the need of creativity? Perhaps machines don't care about being creative, right? It's only something that human beings cares about. Um, does it, uh, is it, is the input of humans solely related to defining the problem space or is the um, role of human should focus more on evaluating creative outcomes? Um, and, but in the sense, if we have, if we have all the data in the world, if we collect more data of how people choose what is creative stuff versus what's not, then essentially it's just a matter of time. Eventually one day when we have enough data, then maybe we can also train machines to, to learn and to recognize what is creative things, uh, options versus what's not, right? Then in this sense, when do we need humans? So this is kind of like a final open question. Um, in this topic. So speaking of evaluation, let's take a look at how human beings have been evaluating creativity in the past. So in the past, um, in research, creativity is often measured by task. Here is a list of some of like the popular tasks that people have been using in the past. And um, I'll give an example of the remote association task. So essentially the remote association task it will give you always give you like a set of three words and then ask participants to come up with something that they can associate with the three words in in the first and so maybe take 30 seconds to look at these words and then see what are the words that you can associate with with the former three so like when you look at cream skate and water what comes to you when you think about show life and role what comes to you and so and so. Okay. So here are some of the most common responses that people come up with in the remote association task. And in the past, people found that if most, most people, most like what they call ordinary people, um, they come up with something that is like highly relevant, come up with something that everyone come up with. Um, and then from there, they, are, uh, they kind of just ran out of idea very quickly. And then they come up with very random stuff that seems have nothing to do with um, the previous three words. And, and they just run out of ideas. Versus like creative experts, um, they start with something that is like not so relevant. And then um, they come up with a sequence of things that seems not so relevant, but also relevant to some extent, but they're very good at coming up with words, um, continuing to come up with more words and more words and more words that seems relevant, um, but also not that obvious um, compared to um, the likelihood of other people coming up with very obvious words. In <clears throat> another way of how people measure creativity is to through this type of like, completing things that is incomplete. 
So they literally use this kind of like drawing task where they would show participants this type of like weird abstract shapes and then see how participants would kind of like go along and then just complete the drawings based on these um, few strokes being shown to them. And along the process, researchers would um, observe whether participants ask questions, whether they take guesses of what's the cause of taking another stroke, what's the consequences of taking another stroke, um, what may lead to what throughout this production process. And also, do participants kind of like suppose or come up with like a hypothetical situation when they think about um, um, when, when they are working on this creative task. But are you satisfied with these sort of creativity tasks? Do you feel like they do a valid job, a justifiable jobs in terms of measuring and capturing how creative people are? That's again, a question um, that you can think about. And so another trend of thoughts, as we mentioned earlier, is to let's just forget about the measurement. We know creativity by heart. We know what is creative versus what is not. So um, let's take a look at all these drawings. Some of these are created by human beings and some of these are created by artificial intelligence. Pick one that you think is the most creative piece and then Let's see how many of them are created by human beings and then how many of them are created by, um, by artificial intelligence. I'll give people 10 seconds and then I'll reveal the answers. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll check the chat. Okay, so to reveal the answers, actually all of the images that you see here are created by artificial intelligence. None of them are um, none of them are created by human beings. So if any of these pieces of work you consider it or they as creative, then perhaps artificial intelligence is also capable of creating creative stuff. Okay. And so in the very last chapter, um, which I only have two minutes to talk about, is this idea of like creativity as an experience for you yourself. Um, so I want to start off by asking you the question. Now, after we talk about all these different viewpoints for creativity, do you think you know how creative you are? Um, in fact, uh, most people actually have some illusions toward their own creative capability. Um, just two years ago, a group of researchers at Cornell, they did this study called the Creative Cliff Study. And what they found is that most people tend to believe their create um, throughout a creative process. Most people believe that their creative capability kind of just falls uh, and, uh, and, and decreases across per uh, periods of times. Meaning that if they ask, for example, ask people to brainstorm for new ideas on a certain topic, people believe that um, the ideas that they come up with earlier are more creative. And then that kind of that level of creativity kind of just reduces over time um, versus when they ask a third person, another person to rate the ideas coming up by um, these participants, people actually, um, other people actually think that, oh no, the, the ideas that people come up with are actually more creative over time, but it's just that people don't realize it. Um, people did not tend to proceed through the process of um, the entire creative processes. And so, do you really know how creative you are when you are working on creative stuff? That is again, a question mark. And then the, another question that people often ask nowadays is, do we want machines to be creative? A lot of people view creativity as like the very last um, territory for humanity. If, uh, if machines are also capable of producing creative stuff, are you happy with that? Or do you feel a sense of something being deprived from you? And um, finally, what do we actually need in human machine co-creativity? 
here I'll show like a few quick video of like um, robots um, working on improvisions in jazz music. So just to give people a sense of what that means, um, that is just like coming up with like random um, and um, stuff during the production of the piece of jazz music. So can people hear the audio? Okay. So this looks pretty impressive, right? Because like not even a lot of human beings can are capable of just producing music on the fly. But in fact, the, the robot is capable of doing it. Um, by improvisation, it really just means it is not pre-script. Um, the, the robot literally listened to what um, the musician play from the piano, and then it plays something um, accordingly. And then let's see the difference between this second video. Does it feel better when the when the robot is kind of like nodding his head and like kind of like acting along the melody? Does that make the creative um, experience better? And then finally, another even more advanced version of the robot. So look at the very end of the video when the when the robot look at the human beings and nod towards the human beings. The human beings actually cannot resist looking at it and then also responding to the robot as well. So in this sense, there are a lot more um, in the experience of human machine co-creativity comparing to just coming up with creative stuff, right? Do we need machines to come up with creative stuff? Or what do we actually need from them? Do we just need their companionship? Do we just need them to be there to push us forward throughout the creative process? Or do we actually need their intellectual contribution? And um, I hope this is something that we all can think more about as we proceed in this age of um, creativity, uh, in this creativity, in the age of human machine partnership. And um, yeah, that's the end of the, of the talk. Um, and I hope you'll um, take away some stuff from, from the lecture. And I know I ran a little bit over time, but thank you all for, for um, sticking around. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them right now. I'm more than happy to address them. Yeah. Yeah, maybe thank let's you. first uh, thanks Angel for the amazing talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do have a few questions. Maybe yeah. let's, uh, let's uh, other people ask first. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the nice comments. Oh, no problem. Um, yeah. um, then maybe I'll ask first. Okay. <laughs> I can have, maybe have a bunch of questions. Yeah. So maybe the first question is um, like, is there any study of like the different levels of creativity and different like uh, across different tasks? For example, I might be more creative in music, but less creative in the painting. Yeah, and also there's also different levels in the sense that, for example, in scientific research, maybe some creativity is like a just produce an incremental result, but there could also be creativity is like producing some breakthrough new framework ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there any study trying to like um, understand the fundamental difference between them and what, what which part of uh, creativity are you mostly thinking of in today's talk? Yeah, so you actually pack in a lot of questions in just one question. <laughs> so, so first of all, regarding your question of like um, whether creativity is domain specific, um, for people who, yeah, uh, the answer to that is yes, people do study domain specific versus domain general um, creativity. 
And the line of research is thinking about creativity more of a sense like knowledge or intelligence. So um, you can also look into relative work. There are a lot of people looking at domain specific um, knowledge um, versus domain general knowledge. But the general takeaway that people have in that line of research is if you are highly, if you are a highly creative person, you, if you are highly capable of think, coming up with creative stuff, um, in general, your creativity is kind of applicable across domains. Um, but of course, if you know more about a certain topics, that just allows you to do a better job in the very first stage of creativity, meaning collecting relevant data and information that helps you throughout the creative process. Um, but if so, for example, but if you have were given that amount of resources that actually support you to, to know a certain domains, then highly creative people can actually apply their creativity across different topics. Yeah. Good question. In I feel like I did not address all of your questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe the second <laughs> part is on like the different levels of creativity. Some can be quite maybe incremental, mm -hmm. yeah, but still maybe surprising. So it regarded as creative. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. might be like a totally like a change the, the field and like uh, what's what, which which one like, are you mostly talking about today? And uh, do you think they have fundamental difference? Yeah. Yeah, so that's another great question. Um, in fact, in um, creativity research, one thing that people talk a lot about is the, uh, there's like a kind of like a theory behind this. Um, it's like the difference between big C creativity versus little C creativity. Um, so as you can probably guess from the name, big C means things that, are, that is like very groundbreaking, that is like entirely new innovation. Um, comparing to like the little C creativity is more of, is more of like solving little pieces of problems. Um, the general sense here is that there's no way to just take one step and then go directly, head directly to the big C creativity. Big C creativity is normally, uh, is, is normally viewed as um, just like adding up across a, a whole series of very good little C creativity. It's like, for example, like people don't design um, a spaceship in just one day. They have to make a series of all very good decisions along the way. So that's like the general sense of what people view the difference between big C creativity and little C creativity. Um, but I think the tricky part is if the little C creativity that you're working on is not that creative, then it can be challenging to lead to um, a big C creativity. Yeah. Okay. Other... So probably what you meant is like in, in general, probably people don't expect there is a super big jump. Yeah, even for like big C creativity, we still think of it as, uh, yeah, some small steps, but maybe the low starts like hidden from the outsider, but uh, yeah, actually, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like people don't assume or um, people don't suppose that you can come up with big C stuff right along the way, yeah. And I see a, a hand raised. Sorry, I can't see everyone's name. Um, do you mind just unmuting yourself and then ask your question? Okay, so I think I shall mute myself and ask a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so my question is, um, I've been thinking about whether there is a difference in creativity forms or creativity skills that can be learned or obtained through working alone solely versus working in groups. Mm -hmm. So I wonder from your perspective, um, in between these two different approaches, working alone, solely, or in a group, is there a difference in what kind of creativity that can be output or learned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is, again, as you can probably guess, there is, again, no, like, a yes or no question to that. 
um, so there are a lot of different, so one thing for sure is that if you're working on creative stuff in groups, it's definitely more complex than you are working on creative stuff alone, right? Because when you're working in groups, it's not just about coming up with creative stuff. People, uh, when people are interacting with other human beings to come up with creative stuff, they are also affected by a lot of, a lot of social factors. They care about like the judgments and feedbacks from other people. So sometimes, um, or most of the times that change the route of creative thinkings of, one, of each and every human beings in the team. On the other hand, if you think about creativity from say from like the associative learning, associated thinking perspectives, if you have multiple human in the groups, you're, you kind of have this larger giant net of things you can draw different connections to, right? <clears throat> There's only a certain amount of things that each human beings know. Um, but if, if, if you're working with other people, especially working with other people that comes from say different disciplines or have very different trainings from yourself, then essentially you have a larger data set um, to draw different perspectives and information from. And that enrich the materials you have to put into your creative thinkings later on. So that's kind of like a trade-off. Um, you can be interrupted by your teammates, but at the same time, they also provide you things that you probably cannot come up with by yourself. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Uh, I think there's a clarification questions, yeah, in the chat. Hmm. Yeah, so big C creativity is basically creatively like an objective definition of creativity. I would say yes, that can be possible. Um, in terms of big C creativity, usually, so again, this is like something that some people believe, some people go against with. Um, but a lot of time when people think about big C creativity, it a lot of time introduces, for example, a new definitions of how, say, for example, how you define an entire field. Um, so I'm kind of like using like a very, like very, cliche kind of example is for example in the past people never think about like using um, before ipad people don't really think about screen as a type of paper but um, when you come up with like a new definition or like an entirely new possible way of how you can use a material that is a lot of time at least where big c creativity starts good question <laughs> So maybe awesome. let's uh, thank uh, Angel again, and I'll stop the recording, and people okay. can stay to ask more questions if there's any. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me.